Good morning, good morning. Uh, we welcome you to our Adult Discipleship Hour. We're, uh, we're very glad this morning to have Bob Free here. He is uh, a volunteer a lawyer. He's been practicing law now. He actually, he wanted me to correct what's in the bulletin. Uh, I love correcting, no. Um, <laughs> What's in the book, he gave him the wrong information. Um, he actually, been, he's actually been practicing law for 50 years. And so he, this is not his uh, first time around on these issues. We are extremely grateful to have him this morning. Uh, we want to give a little bit of a slight plug to Ed Corker, who is the one who gave us the adult Ed folks uh, his name. Uh, he's also Ed Corker's brother-in-law. <laughs> so there you go. Now that explains a lot. Okay. <laughs> But um, uh, I do want to just say that he is, his specialty is uh, talking about it, an advanced care directive, obviously, and how to choose a health care agent. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, your end of life wishes to make sure that you can participate in those. Um, he's an end of life Washington volunteer, former board president, board member, has served on the advisory committee for many years. Um, and has been with the law firm of McDonald, Hogue, and Bayless, if you're familiar with them. And um, uh, uh, especially the last line got to me, what happens when he wants to for the courts. These briefs describe the courts, the differing realities of what happens to families when a competent, terminally ill person is granted or forbidden the choice of eight and nine. And so um, we welcome Bob this morning. And I'll turn it over to you. Okay. And the time is yours. And at quarter to ten, everybody's going to walk out. So, yeah. If you don't, <laughs> well, I'll just want to give you fair warning. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, Thank welcome, you. welcome. Thank you very much. If the uh, mic is not loud enough, or you have trouble hearing me, just wave your hand. So, Bob Free is my name, no. um, and I no. just retired from practicing law this year. Uh, so, um, no more being a lawyer, but involved with this organization since the mid-1990s. End of Life Washington was started in uh, 1988, um, and it was just started by volunteers that got together at a uh, university Unitarian church in Seattle and wanted to deal with people <laughs> having questions and issues about their end of life. And so um, we've been going pretty strong since that time. Um, we have three uh, main things that we do. Um, we do education and resources like this. We have a website. You go to End of Life Washington. Uh, look at that website that has a lot of information, all the forms that I'm going to be talking about today, other information uh, that is, you can get to learn. Uh, we also do support, one-on-one -on -one support, with people that are called volunteer client advisors that help people at the very end of their life if they choose to hasten their death uh, or if they have questions about what, what the process of dying is, how to use hospice, that type of thing. Um, we have over 100 volunteers doing that work. And we also do advocacy and public policy. Uh, we were the ones that drafted the initiative in 2008 which uh, got us the, what we sometimes call the Death with Dignity Law, it's called the Death with Dignity Act, that was passed by initiative in 2008, went into effect in 2009. As you know, um, Oregon was the first state that did this, passed this kind of law. Uh, we were the second, now there are 10 states that uh, have a law very similar to our Washington law, our Death with Dignity Act. Um, and we just recently, in the last legislative session in 2023, amended that law to update it and provide more information and uh, types of things that people are concerned about. So, um, what we're going to be doing today is, um, there, talking about end of life. It's obviously a difficult subject for people to talk about. Uh, but we encourage people to talk with your children, with your neighbors, with your spouse, about what you want at the end of your life. Um, we have trouble, we, as we know, talking about death sometimes. Uh, people use phrases like pushing up daisies, uh, kick the bucket, uh, things such as that, because we're uncomfortable talking about 
on that subject, but we're going to try to make you more comfortable about talking about it. Um, so um, part one is the dealing with planning ahead, uh, finding your support team, making your desires known through advanced directives. And then part two will be, um, they'll be talking about hopefully too much, not too many people will miss this, but it's, it's um, if you decide you want to hasten your death, things aren't going well, and you want to uh, hasten your death, uh, we'll talk about that. So, um, so if, if you have difficulty talking about death, we have something on our website called Values Worksheet. And this is allows you to say what your desires and um, values are at the end of life. And this will enable you to talk to your children about it if you, if you fill this out, to talk to other people, um, and to prepare yourself and family members with uh, preparing the documents, the legal documents that you would need at the end of life. Um, so, um, but the values worksheet talks about things such as do you want to be living independently? Uh, do you want to live with your family, with your children? Um, how do you, how much do you care about being free of physical limitations? Uh, do you want to go into the hospital if certain things happen or not? Um, and so that's a good place to start. And then what that can lead to is a uh, power of attorney for health care. An agent, a health care agent, does not have to be a lawyer. Uh, and usually it's not a lawyer. It's usually family members or other people that are close to you that can help make decisions about um, your life and your death at the time if you don't have the ability to communicate that um, to your doctor, to other people uh, directly. This is something that you can uh, that other people can look at to see if, if you what your wishes and desires are. How many people have, have an advanced directive already? Okay. It's something that um, all of us should have, even young people. Um, so um, you're not too young to not have one <laughs> because get hit by a bus, have a, a serious illness, and to have it uh, in line so that you can uh, give that to a physician or your family member can give it to a physician and say, this is what mom wanted, this is what my spouse wanted, and so do this or do that. Um, so um, that's something that's important for everybody to have. Um, then the other thing you want to do to plan ahead is to um, create this advanced directive that um, would tell your uh, medical people what kind of uh, treatments you would want, what kind of care you would want at the end of life. We have one on our website which is very good, uh, very detailed. Maybe some people might think it's a little too detailed. It goes into all types of situations. Um, but other places have uh, five wishes. Um, there's a advanced care planning um, document by um, him, the uh, Honoring Choices organization. So you don't have to use one on our website if you don't have one, but it's important that everybody have one. And you appoint in that document um, an agent that will speak for you if you're not able to speak, if you've had a stroke or a heart attack, or you're in the hospital, um, and this document would uh, be something that would help your doctor uh, know what to do. Um, so when you complete your advance directive, you want to make sure that it's signed correctly, that you um, have it witnessed by, have it notarized or witnessed by two, two people, not your doctor, not a family member, but uh, someone else that would validate that you have signed this and this is what your uh, desires are. You should only have one because you don't want several of them lying around in confusion about which one uh, did mom fill out? Um, so um, there is an additional directive we have on our website that a lot of people don't know about. It's something we created. It's called the uh, Living with Dementia Mental Health Care Directive. It's uh, again something that would tell 
your family or your physician, this is what I want to happen if I have dementia. Do I want to go into a, um, a assisted living home? Do I really want to be able to stay at home and have my children or caretakers take care of me? Um, all those types of things. When Who's going to make the decision that I should stop driving? So those are all things on the uh, living with dementia healthcare directive. I'll talk a little later about the other one on there, my instructions for oral feeding and drinking, which is also something that would be used uh, at the end stage of, of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Um, another document that is created by the state is the PULSE form, which is a uh, portable order for life-sustaining treatment. This is something filled out by either you or your um, healthcare agent and your physician. It has to be signed by a doctor. This is something that would be um, at the really almost very end stage of your life. Um, when you're 90 years old and you know that death is coming or you've had a very serious illness, you have cancer um, or you've been having heart attacks. This says um, what kind of treatment, I, again, I want do I want to be resuscitated? If I have um, a uh, serious pneumonia, do I want to have antibiotics or not? Uh, so this is uh, something that you would put on your refrigerator at home or have it a place where people could find it if um, there is an event that uh, causes you to not be able to speak for yourself. So that's an important thing to have too. So, if you have these documents, uh, then you would have completed your advanced planning and preparation for um, the end of life. So, what I really want to get into, um, I'm going to skip the questions now, um, because I want to talk about end of life choices, the choices you have uh, at the end of your life um, to have a kind of death you would want a dignified death. Um, so the main thing we tell people, and people don't sometimes know this, is you can refuse treatment. You know, you don't have to continue the uh, chemotherapy. You don't have to take the medication for uh, heart attacks. If you think that this is, death is gonna come, and I want it to come naturally, uh, you don't have to uh, accept treatment. Um, if you do uh, decide you want to stop the curative treatment, uh, there is something called palliative care, which is taking care of you and making you comfortable at the end of life, um, and that you, even with or without, uh, trying to cure you at the same time. But if you um, are facing death fairly soon, if it's within six months, according to your doctor, then you can go into hospice. And hospice, we encourage all of our people that come to us to utilize hospice. It's becoming a great thing. It wasn't in existence 40 years ago, but um, it's, it's a way of having people um, receive end of life care, either in your home, in a hospital, in an assisted living place. Hospice will provide counseling and medical care and nurses and doctors covered by Medicare and Medicaid, and uh, also covered by a lot of insurance companies too, so that um, you can have um, counseling relief um, facing death. You can have someone do the uh, end of life choices that I'm gonna be talking about in a minute. Um, and so this is something that you would wanna consider um, at the end of life if your doctor thinks you have six months or less to live. Um, so, if you want to hasten your death, you decide that um, you're in a lot of pain, you have too much discomfort, that you have no physical autonomy anymore, that other people are required to care for you around the clock, you can decide to hasten your death, and there are different ways to do that. In Washington, uh, this is the Death with Dignity Law. We're calling it medical aid in dying now. It's not suicide. Uh, legally, it's not suicide. 
um, it's considered um, hastening your death and allowing you to die a natural death, but uh, hastening it along by taking medication. Um, and so it's done for to re reduce the suffering, reduce the pain and the anxiety. Um, the Death with Dignity Act has these qualifications. You have to meet these qualifications to be able to have your doctor write a prescription so that you can take some medication that would hasten your death and to die within um, minutes or at least within a few hours of taking the medication. Um, again, it has to be a terminal illness with uh, less than six months to live. Right now, you have to be a resident of Washington State. We think that's going to go away. Um, it's gone away in several other states, and so, but um, the doctor's going to ask you, you know, are you a resident? Are you 18 years of age or older? And are you capable of self-administering the medication mm -hmm. to make sure that somebody isn't pushing this on you so that you don't really want to do this? Um, you have to be the one to swallow the medication or even if you have ALS or another degenerative disease that um, you can take the medication by pushing a pump on your feeding tube or some other way if we have a mechanical device. But you have to be the one to, to make that final decision. In Canada, the doctor can give you a shot to uh, help end your life right away. But um, in Washington State and all the U.S. states that have the laws, um, you have to be able to self-administer. There has to be two doctors, providers, or nurse practitioners, or physician assistants that say that you meet these qualifications. You have a terminal illness of less than six months. Uh, you have decision-making capacity. If you have serious dementia, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, a doctor's gonna say, I'm sorry, I can't give you a prescription because I don't believe you understand uh, what's, what's happening to you. Um, so those are the qualifications. Um, the story that I wanted to tell you a little about is about Christine, one of our clients, that um, had a very serious breast cancer um, in 2012. Uh, she was able to do chemotherapy and the, the cancer went into remission. But uh, about eight years later, it came back very strong, very forceful, and she said, I don't want to go through that chemotherapy again. I don't want to um, have all of that discomfort. Um, I want to end my life by using the Death with Dignity Act and to um, take the medication. She, those are her two daughters. They were able to be around her at the end of her life. Uh, they were there when she took the medication. She had a very peaceful uh, death that um, stopped the pain and stopped the, the uh, problems that she was having from the cancer. And um, she was very happy to be able to use the law. Um, so if medical aid in dying is not an option that you have more than six months to live, um, or that you don't have real uh, capacity to make that decision. There is something called um, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Um, okay, uh, be said, and this is something that we help people do, not as much as um, medical aid and dying, but this is you choose to hasten your death by stopping eating and drinking. It takes one to two weeks to die if you do this. It's not easy, um, it takes a lot of willpower. You need people to support you. Your doctor has to be supportive so that you, if you need a medication to deal with anxiety that you're having, um, all those types of things. So, um, but it is a voluntary legal way to um, hasten your death if you decide you want to do that. Um, this is a story about Jeff, the man in that picture, that was one of our clients that um, had a serious degenerative disease um, and it was taking away his ability to walk, to swallow, to talk, um, and he decided as soon as this uh, disease started coming on pretty strong after two years that he wanted to hasten his death by voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. So he had all those people around him him. Yeah, it took him uh, a week and a half to die. He 
never changed his mind. He never um, started eating again. Uh, and um, he was able to have a peaceful death. His caretakers, his hospice caretakers, said it was one of the most peaceful and beautiful deaths that they had ever imagined or ever seen. So um, the, you, what you have to do is have a team, again, of people to help you um, and all various kinds of diseases, including dementia. People that have early stage dementia um, or even Alzheimer's diagnosis, but they still know what they're doing and they still know they want to hasten their death and they still have the willpower to do that. Uh, this is an option for them as well. Uh, particularly if they can't, they're not going to have that six month diagnosis of dementia. Uh, and so um, this is something that's available and more and more people are choosing this. This is something that's existed from time immemorial that people naturally stop having an interest in eating and drinking. Um, and so um, this is not a new or unusual thing, but it is something that we're able to talk about more and tell people you have this choice if this is something that you want to do. Jean, Jean was a woman that had um, Lewy body's disease, it was called. It's a type of disease that takes away your ability to walk and eventually talk. And she had um, seen her mother die of Alzheimer's, and it was a long, horrible death for her. And when it came, came Jean's time, she said, I'm not going to do that. I want to stop eating and drinking. And she did and was able to end her life peacefully. So, um, if you have dementia, these are the different stages of dementia. Some functional uh, decline or early Alzheimer's, um, moderate to mild Alzheimer's, and moderately severe to severe Alzheimer's. The advanced directives can help you, the pulse can help you. If you have the early stages um, and you, you're making your desires known, all of those things with mild stages too. Another thing that can be done is this mild, very end on the right hand side, my instructions for oral feeding and drinking. Um, my sister had Alzheimer's. She's older than we are. Older than I, I mean, <laughs> not older than all of you, I don't think. <laughs> um, that, um, and we didn't have this document at the time she was declining from Alzheimer's. And I talked with her healthcare agent, my niece, and we talked to the facility where she was, the memory care unit, and said, if she stops showing an interest in food, you know, don't force a feeder, don't spoon feed her, don't push her to eat every, every day and to drink. Uh, let her die by just deciding that she is not interested in eating anymore. And this is what happened, and I think she died much sooner than she would have otherwise. But what I did, and with other people in the organization, we created this document called My Instructions for Oral Feeding and Drinking that says, if I reach that stage where I'm not showing an interest in eating and drinking, that I have serious dementia or Alzheimer's, uh, this document tells your healthcare agents and your the people that are taking care of you, your doctor, let me die by not eating. Don't spoon feed me which is just a way of um, mechanically getting the food and drink into your system, even though you don't want it. Yes? How does that differ from the kinds of instructions you would generally do in a, in a uh, directed, to, directed to physicians? Um, it differs in the sense that it says it's in advance, and it's not something that would be <clears throat> legally enforceable, I'll be honest with you. Uh, court would probably say, don't, you know, I'm going to have a legal order, don't spoon feed this person. But it is something that they, you're making this when you do have ability to make those decisions and put it in writing so that your people know um, when you reach that stage, when you're pretty bad off probably as far as Alzheimer's go, so that you can, um, they can stop feeding and drinking. Whereas you can still you can have in an advanced directive, right? Yes. A direction not to not to uh, not to 
provide uh, intravenous uh, hydration right. or nutrition. Right. Yeah, I don't want two feeding, that type of thing. That would be in the regular advanced directive. But this is different in that you're talking about oral? Oral, right, right. Um, so that's something you want to consider too. It's on our website. It's something that you would be able to um, decide and, and say that you want only comfort care, only if I really want to eat and showing a desire to eat or to drink. Um, you can't refuse to give it to somebody that wants to eat and wants to drink. Um, but if um, they've decided and they've indicated that they're not interested in it, they don't want to be force-fed, then, um, then this is an alternative. So um, I've actually gone through this faster than I normally do, but I wanted to save time for questions. I know several of you have to uh, go to choir practice or those people but um, so are there any other questions that people have about these things okay um, so um, summary is that you always have the ability to uh, refuse treatment you have the ability to use medical medical aid in dying if you're within six months of dying um, and you have some ability to control, deal with dementia uh, with by signing a voluntarily stop eating and drinking directive. So, um, most important step, as we said before, is to get the healthcare agent and your healthcare team in line, um, and to know that who's going to support you at the end of life and then have these documents in place um, to show that you've been planning ahead. Um, the boxes here of checking, uh, make sure that your end of life ready, we call it ready for your end of life, is you uh, have your support team, you've completed your advanced directives, you've evaluated a need for a pulse. I don't have a pulse yet because I'm not, I don't think I'm facing death that soon, but um, usually if, if you're in your late 80s, it's something you would want to consider having because you know you're going to die at some point and uh, it, it's good to have that. Um, and to share your advanced directive with your children or whoever is on your support team, make sure your doctor has it in the medical records, so place it in the medical records. So uh, at the hospital or wherever you're getting treatment, so that you um, and yes, go ahead. That's a, that was a question I had. I had heard sometime, quite a long time ago, that you should have a copy at the hospital. If you're saying whatever your directive is, it should be a copy to your primary care. Right. You know, yes. Yeah. Okay. And your hospital, you know, which if you many know which you want to tell people, you know, carry carry a copy in your um, copy is as good as the original. Carry a copy in your glove compartment of your car in case you have a stroke and driving to you know the grocery store or something, so that it's available and people know how to access it. Give one to your healthcare agent and talk to them about what's in it, so that they understand what your desires are. So if your healthcare agent had a copy, but the doctor did not, and the hospital did not, it still would be, yes. they would respect that it in the would, hospital? Yes, it, and okay. uh, it would still it, be it, something that, that they could take to the, the hospital or wherever you are to say, look, this is what this person okay. said she wanted. Um, I'll be honest, not all doctors will follow them. Um, and we've yeah. had issues with sometimes mm -hmm. doctors saying, no, I don't think that's reasonable. Um, uh, the healthcare agent can also decide they don't want to fall. They can mm -hmm. say, this isn't bad enough to really do what, what um, you check the box on to do. And so, um, but um, if you have done it, it's more likely that you're going to be able to have your wishes implemented by having it documented like this. Okay. And the other question yes. I have is you said that, um, uh, that with hospice, it was be covered by Medicare for six months. Is that the, the limit of when the you know Medicare would pay? No, I mean there are people people that have been in. I met a gentleman the other day. He'd been in hospice for a year and a half because they thought he was going to die within six mm -hmm. months, but he didn't. You know? mm -hmm. And so um, 
you can continue receiving the hospice care. If you really get better, they may say, I'm sorry, we're going to not do this hospice care any longer. Um, but um, if possible, you can stay in there for a long time. Yeah. Well, then would it, would it be, for example, with the hospice then, would then it become palliative care that would be given? Right. And that is that something that Medicare also pays for as a palliative care, or is that? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so things that we don't do is we don't do um, take care of uh, final disposition of, of the body if, if you die. Um, we don't take care of last will testaments, those types of things. Uh, you want to have a, a, a lawyer or someone help you prepare that document. Um, there is an organization that says at the bottom here, Worry Free Wednesdays, that if, if you need more help in making these decisions about what you're doing, you need help filling out an advance directive, there is this organization, uh, sort of a spinoff of End of Life Washington, that will meet with you and talk to you about um, your end of life choices. And so you can Google Worry Free Wednesdays and um, uh, they can arrange to talk to you and help you. All of these services that I've been talking about are free. Uh, we don't charge anything uh, to people. We're entirely supported by donations from individuals. We get no government or foundation support. Um, and it's, we're mainly volunteers, uh, people like myself. We do have six staff um, that um, do some of this work for us, but it's, it's a real volunteer driven organization and so um, the resources again are the um, website where all of these things will tell you how to volunteer if you want to uh, additional choices that I haven't covered such as um, dealing with final exit or other organizations will help you um, and um, you can look at the website if you really want to get more information and you're able to donate uh, to us if you want to um, by um, having an online donation through the website. So um, if you want to have this kind of information to uh, another organization that you uh, are involved with or friends that might need the information, um, spread the word. We have uh, online uh, Zoom uh, meetings every two months or I'm sorry, every month, uh, twice a month, uh, which goes through this information like I'm doing right now for people that don't have an organization, they, they don't come to it it's live, but they want to receive the information. So uh, tell people about that um, and spread the word about, about these things. Um, things you can do to, to help support in the life of Washington is you can volunteer. Uh, we provide training to people to do the educational presentations, to become an, a, a volunteer client advisor, to go out and talk to people at the end of life that are going to consider medical aid and dying. Uh, our volunteers are, will be there on the day of you take the medication uh, to make sure that um, it all goes smoothly. Um, some hospices now are getting much more involved and will be able to help you uh, if you choose medical aid and dying death with dignity. Uh, not all hospices will, but um, some will. And we encourage people, ask that question before you go into hospice. I'm thinking about medical aid and dying. Will you support me if that happens? And if they will, great, that would make it much easier. They provide the doctors. You wouldn't have to go out and search for doctors. But we have a lot of people that um, belong to a Catholic uh, healthcare institution, and their doctors are prohibited from being involved in this type of thing. They're not able to do the diagnosis or to write the prescription. But um, if people come to us, we are able to find a doctor, a volunteer doctor, that will help you. Um, we have over 40 uh, volunteer doctors, mostly retired physicians, that will um, help you through this process again at no charge. The only charge is the uh, paying for the medication, which is 
about $800, it's expensive. It's a uh, compound medication that the volunteer plan advisor will mix uh, right before you would uh, drink it down and put it in the feeding tube. Um, and so um, that's possible. So, yes. So, any other questions? Yes. Do you have any resources on choosing a hospice provider? I mean, um, no. <laughs> Not really. We're compiling a list. One of the changes to the law in the 2023 um, legislation was that hospices now are required to say what their policy is about using the medical aid in dying. Um, as hospitals are also required to put it, their policies public. And it's just now being, they have to do that, and we're gonna, are gonna put on our website a list of the hospices that will support you uh, so that you can go there and see, you know, which one is, is the kind that would support you. So that's just coming on right now, um, because before, um, people didn't know, you didn't know, also, the facility where you go if you're going for assisted living, well, they allow you to ingest the medication in your apartment or your home in that facility. Some say no. Um, we're trying to push one to, so that they have to. And we'll also have a list of those on the website, too. Uh, but that's something you, you're going to um, Horizon House or someplace else like that. You'd want to ask, are you going to allow me to do this in my apartment that I'm renting? Um, that's how I decide I want to die at home. And Rising House will say yes, but um, you want to ask other agencies and, and places if they will do that. Any other questions? One other question. Thank you, Green. It, for uh, most, for the largest portion of my experience, uh, healthcare uh, powers of attorney required that the individual, uh, the, the principal, not be able to communicate. Right. Uh, the new power of attorney statute that we've had since 2017 doesn't have that specific requirement. Can you have now a healthcare agent? who can give direction on your behalf, even though you are still, still have full capacity. Well, you know, I've appointed my son as my health agent. <laughs> if I have full capacity, I would not want my son telling Agreed. his doctor, my, my doctor, what to do um, if I'm saying, no, I don't want to do that. Or, yeah, I've decided, even though I put on my health care directive that I didn't want to be resuscitated after a heart attack, but now I do, and, and so um, I think that a healthcare agent can't legally, if, if the person has capacity, can't legally say, no, do this for him, you know. So, um, but, you know, but that's, but the issue can't The problem, happen. yeah, that's an issue. So you want to appoint someone, it may not even be your spouse or a close family member that you love and like a lot uh, because you want to choose someone that's going to be um, confident and stable and be able to communicate with the doctor without you know falling apart and so um, be careful about who you choose as your health care agent. Any other questions? Okay, well we finished in time to allow you to go to your service so I appreciate your listening. Nice, nice talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. We appreciate you being you. here. Um, and just to uh, finish, just Kurt Lennon, his mom used medical aid in dying at the end of her life. And Kurt worked with End of Life Washington, and he said that they were just fantastic. He said one phone call, and then they led their family through the whole process and very compassionate and so he wholeheartedly supports you and uh, and Kurt also said if you want to have any personal conversations with him about any of this 
um, he'd be happy to talk to you. So again, thank you, Bob. Okay. We so much appreciate you being here. Thank you.